about. Um, welcome everybody to Tree Meditations, Mental Health, Wellness, and Belonging. Um, oh gosh, that is not how you change it. Oops. Um, with Jay Nyla McNeil, um, a social scientist, multidisciplinary artist, and entrepreneur. Um, Jay Nyla, why don't you take it away? Hello, y'all. Good morning. It's nice and early here in Long Beach, California. And today I'll be talking about navigating stigma and shame in getting mental health support and learning how to shamelessly seek and receive care. Um, and personally, I'm a life coach and I started in the field of psychology. So it's been interesting to navigate stigma even within the field of uh, people that are supposed to be fixing this problem. So this is uh, Reflections on Mental Health and Wellness Stigma learning to shamelessly seek and receive care as a life coach. At a conference I attended in my very early career as a research scientist, it was called the Queering Psychedelics Conference in San Francisco, really cool stuff, uh, in 2019. A practitioner in the final group panel brought up remarks that he'd learned that many doctors don't actually see the doctors themselves. And that share really stuck with me. After this point, continuing to move along, initiating myself to professional research psychology, I also noticed that my colleagues were struggling from everything from depression, anxiety, isolation, burnout, loneliness, and more. And I noticed that often those of us training to be psychologists and psychological researchers weren't engaging with each other. We weren't engaging with psychologists, counselors, coaches, or anyone uh, who could help us with access to care. And a lot of that was because there's a lack of time and a lack of avail availability of resources in our training. We were working a lot. Um, so through that, um, and as care became more accessible, especially online, um, more creative care has been emerging for everyday people and for professionals alike. And as colleagues and I team up to provide more care for each other and our communities, I've been reflecting on past mental health stigma in the fields of care work and mental health as I've grown into my own career. It's taken a lot of unlearning for me to be able to talk about this and a lot of understanding where the field is coming from too. Um, but from a personal standpoint, I grew up in a household where therapy was seen as like weak and frivolous and wasn't always an option. So there was never any time for anything like it, but I still fell in love with psychology and I still wanted to become a researcher. And with that, I held mental health stigma and still went into the field simultaneously. Um, which would send me into an ongoing process of undoing and relearning and navigating shame within myself. Having near medicinal conversations with my colleagues and in field forums like seminars and conferences at large really helped too. We were all sort of grappling with the fact that there was still stigma in the field. While depression is one of the most common experiences of mental illness in the US, Regardless of race, class, sex, uh, according to the University of San Diego, Twinge 2014, Black, Indigenous, and Brown people experience negative mental health effects disproportionately due to systemic issues of racism and classism with Black and Brown gender non-conforming, non-binary, gender fluid, two-spirit people experiencing adverse mental health effects from navigating additional stigma. So that's gender minority stigma and shame. It's stigma and shame that exacerbates these adverse mental health experiences at large in whole and makes that worse for some people. So with this, as a Black Filipino non-binary person and a qualitative and mixed method scientist studying difficult experiences in the LGBTQ community, I had to learn to shamelessly advocate for help and locating mental health support for myself. I became my own peer advocate until I was able to express myself enough to join services and support groups. And at a certain point in my training, I attended four routine support groups with peers, therapists, or counselors, 
and was seeing a counselor 101. And as much as that sounds, it was very, very needed. Activist, writer, and distinguished professor Bell Hooks once said, rarely, if ever, are any of us healed in isolation. Healing is an act of communion. I believe what keeps us from wanting to talk about our mental health, even in the field of mental health, has a lot to do with shame. And it has a lot to do with intergenerational traumas passed down to us, whether that be socially or epigenetically, meaning our parents and their parents training about stress and work culture were passed down to us, affecting our genes, expression of our genes, and making us more likely to experience health problems like hypertension, heart disease, gut issues, and mental illness as a consequence of those things. So not only are we dealing with the sociocultural consequences of toxic work culture, we're also moving through old vestiges of toxic psychology, and we have memories of what our four people had experience um, in work as well. So it's imperative to come into a personal knowledge of the way we process stress, how we understand our overall holistic health with our mental health at the forefront and not our work. So our mental health matters and it's been swept under the rug for too long and it's becoming an epidemic. Um, so during the FCC's recent forum on the launch of 988, which is a new soon to be national suicide crisis hotline. FCC chairwoman, Jessica Rosenworcel stated that suicidality has been at an all time high since World War II. So this is an issue that will affect all of us at some point or perhaps has already affected us, whether it be you know our own selves or a family member or a friend. So recognizing that stigma and shame are the culprit for these things here, we can come to understand stigma and shame a little bit more. So some people would call this, uh, uh, practitioners, healers would call this stagnant energy, causing blockages and misalignment with our purpose and clarity in our lives. And consequently, our work comes with that. So stigma and shame hide us from our truths and often keep us from being well. And if that's happening and that's present, how could your professional life thrive? And what's working with without purpose? So if I had not joined those community oriented support groups, if I hadn't found those counselors, haven't navigated my own internalized shame about coming into mental health, I don't know where I would be. I would not be here <laughs> at all. So um, learning how to talk about it was the first step. Learning that I had any issue was the first step. And one year in higher ed, I was working 60 to 80 hours a week, training in STEM, earning my degrees and certificates, training my lab members, while also managing a new independent career in the arts separately. So there was no handbook or guide that could have told me that I was doing too much and that my mental health was suffering because of it. In fact, the day after graduation from my undergrad grad studies in the second year of my early career, I became extremely sick. And it was so bad that the recovery took me three years to feel like myself again. So it was really necessary for me to take a step back, ground in community care work, which I did over those years. And in that time, I also lived my life. I experienced life outside of work and school. I chose not to work much at all, and I officially launched my tiny, tiny startup at the time, Mixed Lifestyling, which was a psychological research-informed coaching practice that mostly used magic to help people. So I used tarot cards and oracle cards. Since then, has expanded. But ever since that recovery period and my launch, I've shamelessly asked for, for and received care in public on social media and shown engagement in the rest publicly and community to model the praxis of Black feminists who recognize care and rest as a requirement for quality work, while also marketing towards a culture of life and wellness 
first. <laughs> my practice focuses on developing not just work, but life work. As I recognize work-life balance is a myth alongside elders and olders who've been practicing living in and on purpose much longer than I have. So as someone who works in providing care during a pandemic, Bell's Hooks words mean a lot to me right now. And Bell Hooks among many of our thought and practice stewards who survivor, survived much to share the importance of community healing and rest is among those who we honor in changing work culture. Groups like Map Ministry live by the words and dreams of these leaders in rest and healing. We honor them in our actions. We breathe together. We teach people to take breaks. We wrangle in our imposter syndrome. <laughs> And we connect people to their dreams. So a requisite to all this work was investigating my own shame. In this, I ask every professional in all fields to honor rest and time away, honor reaching out for support, and honor your body's needs for the sake of your mental health. Hold it to be as important as the work that we do for the sake of the future and for the sake of possibility and a revolution of healthier, more holistic work. Possibility models exist. We can be them. And our highest quality rest means high quality transformation and results for people we're working with. So it's time to be models of shamelessness and speaking up for what we need. We must be examples of annihilating mental health stigma and for professionals in mental health and helping careers, it's important for us to especially decide how we may model this in our own lives and how we may bring community into this process. For professionals, we must prioritize our holistic health to do good work at all. So we move from a powerful place when we are recharged and present. And when our energy is full and sparkling, we become magnetic. Start by practicing and admitting to yourself when you're exhausted, when you're potentially burnt out, and make a vow to yourself to never work from that space. Create a care plan, care plan that your trusted community members can access and engage in it often. And see this as important as your dental health, as brushing your teeth. If we learn to make maintaining our mental health a top priority, and if we are coming to our work excited and well, we will have no issues in doing exactly the kind of work we want to get done. So this is not to say we will not work hard, but the work will be well mapped. Our honesty with ourselves and our capacities will inspire positive energy for the better. And because nothing pays as quality rest. That's me. Thank you. For awesome. Thank you. Great job. Um, I can find that reaction again. We'll give you the uh, applause. Um, okay. So I just put Jay Dyla's contact information in the chat. If anybody would like to reach out over, what, uh, over their website or their Instagram. Um, and I am sharing now the link to enter the lobby again and join round two, unless Jane Ella, you have anything else, but I think that's probably it, right? Well, if folks have any questions that they wanna ask, they can ask them here or feel free to send them to my website. And- Can I ask a quick question? For sure. Yeah, so um, you talked a lot about, um, you know, identifying when you're tired, establishing a clear plan, um, and really just valuing where you are now. So I guess my question is, um, for people who may not be used to or who don't know how to identify when they're tired, um, what tools um, would be useful for them? The most immediate tool we have is our breath. And if we feel as though we're experiencing shortness of breath, if our shoulders are tight while we're breathing, if we're breathing and a lot of noise is up here or a lot of pain is in our back and we're present with that, that should inform us that, you know, maybe it's time that I take a break. Maybe it's time that I take a power nap. 
And some people don't know how to take power naps too, which is something I got trained in doing in school, showing people how to access breath, to take a 20 to 20 second to 20 minute nap, it's a micro nap, and just recharge from that. But our most immediate tool we have is tapping into our breath. And if it feels like it's difficult to do that, you know, perhaps we might stop. Any other questions? I see Renwick in the chat. Um, does anyone here feel like it's hard to ask for help when needed? I still feel like it's hard to ask for help, but the reason why we make community care plans, which is something like, you know, hi, my name is, uh, I've added you to this Google Docs. So when I'm in a bad time, you can help me putting, you know, like, maybe I might need help with my dishes. Maybe I might need help with grabbing groceries, cleaning the house, really practical things. Um, it's difficult to ask in a culture where we have not been taught to do this and to sweep things under the rug and to keep working and to keep grinding and all that. So um, pushing back against that is the point, but it's gonna take practice. It feels uncomfortable, but I encourage asking for help at um, all costs. Okay, well, thank you so much, Janelle. I really appreciate it. Um, excellent stuff. Um, the link to go back to the lobby is in the chat. Um, and yeah, thank you all for attending. And thank you, Janelle, again.